Small Town Tales podcast is produced by 22 Creations Multimedia, LLC. This is the show where you'll hear paranormal tales, haunting legends, and spiritual insights about the metaphysical world. Explore the paranormal through small town lore with experts and guests from all walks of life. Welcome to Small Town Tales Podcast with C.L. Thomas. Welcome to another episode of Small Town Tales Podcast. I'm C.L. Thomas from somewhere in the Mojave. I have finally finished my book, Dancing with Demons, which the ebook version was officially released on Friday the 13th, following an eclipse the next day. You just don't get any more witchy than that. The hard copy is coming out soon. I just need to finish uploading the book cover for it, and I expect that to be finished pretty soon. Now that Dancing with Demons project has ended, what do you think C.L. Thomas is going to do? That's right. I am undergoing some exciting new research projects for two new projects set to be released next year. I'm working on a new book project scheduled for June, and the other project is going to be a film. It's going to be a documentary that will be released in October. Stay tuned for more of that later. The weather is finally cooling off here in the Mojave. The days are still a little warm on average in the mid-90s, but the evenings have been dropping down to the 60s, making it chilly and rather eerie out in the desert. When you're like me and you live in Vegas, you have access to a lot of neat places, such as Tonopah's Clown Motel, the Armagosa Opera House, and even Area 51. So sometimes when I get bored, I tend to go out into the desert just to mess around. So last night, I called up a friend and I and she's a historian, and we walked around some of the 100-year-old buildings that still stand in Goldfield, and she was telling me some of the tales surrounding those buildings, and as we were walking around, the sun was going down, and I have to admit, it became a little eerie. As fall rolls in, we see a lot of changes going on around us, and not with the season, not just with the season. I decided to change up small town just a little bit for Halloween and to discuss a notorious serial killer from the turn of the century, Jack the Ripper, with author and historian Neil Story. Stay tuned. More after this. What if demonic activity isn't as rare as you've been led to believe? Author and creator of Small Town Tales podcast, C.L. Thomas, shares her terrifying demonic experiences that forever changed her life and the way she views the paranormal. From disembodied voices to poltergeist activity, shadow figures, physical scratches, and illnesses to literally losing her entire livelihood. C.L. Thomas takes the reader on a personal and chilling journey that she lived through herself. Learn why the Hollywood portrayal of demons is not accurate and why a demonic infestation is more insidious than what you see in films. Dancing with Demons will be available in both print and digital the first week of October 2023. Order on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Signed copies will be available through clthomas.org. Dancing with Demons by C.L. Thomas. Tonight I welcome Neil Story, BBC's award-winning author and historian, to discuss the legend surrounding Jack the Ripper case. Neil specializes in the history of Great Britain in the 19th and 20th centuries. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, C.L. Great to be here. You have written over 50 books that are all themed around Britain's somewhat more eclectic and dark history, wouldn't you say? Absolutely right. Absolutely. If you've, I mean, I've lectured for students of all ages for many, many years. And if you need to grab them and grab their interest, what better than dark history to defibrillate students after a heavy weekend? <laughs> How did you get interested in the darker side? Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's a smashing question. I guess I've always been drawn to it. I grew up in a, a very historic county in England uh, called Norfolk. And if you look at England, it's, it's kind of a triangle shape. And that big bump on the side, the far east, that's Norfolk. And it's the land that Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder general, it was part of the East Anglia where he was working. It's an area that is filled with folk tales and legends and stories. It's a very agricultural county. So if you live in a a green area where there's farming, 
Um, rural areas often cling on to folklore, often because before in, in Great Britain, we had a national health service in the latter part of the 20th century. Before then, there's no national health service. So who are you going to go and see if your horse is ill? your car is sick or you or what are your kids is sick you go and see these cunning folks so there's 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 legends there's he, what they used to call hedge witchery uh and i say that with love my my great grandmother was uh she was a cunning woman as they used to call them a kind of country midwife that brought them and generations of her family going back brought kids into this world and did a little bit of hedge witchery to help local people when they were sick that's so interesting. America has somewhat of a version of that, and yeah. it's uh, centered around the Appalachian, and they have their own version of witchcraft. It's it's very interesting, but it kind of yes. ties into that as well. People people shouldn't always think of witchcraft instantly as something that's a, a black magic, and I, I dare say many of your listeners will know about the Wiccan path, you know, which is a, a more modern version of kind of we might call white witchery. You know, because if you if you really are wanting to be a black witch, well, for goodness sake, uh, <laughs> whatever you curse somebody with, it will come back three times upon you. So maybe don't curse people. <laughs> it seems <laughs> quite easy to me. <laughs> so with all of your topics and everything, I mm. kind of wanted to focus a little more on one of your books, and that is The Grim Onomac of Jack the Ripper. Oh, my goodness. All right. Jack the Ripper seems to be one of the first serial killers that has become well known. But yet we don't really know anything about this guy. Is that true? Well, you, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. Because, because Jack the Ripper, to my knowledge in Great Britain, there was no other recognizable serial killer before Jack. I dare say they did exist. Uh, but because communications were such, there wasn't until the 19th century a police force. <laughs> Hello, cat. <laughs> there wasn't a police force as we'd know it. So, I love cats, by the way. <laughs> See, they want to join in and have fun. So it wasn't really a police force. They had what they called the, the night watch uh, and there were town guards and that kind of thing. But there was no way to coordinate uh, national investigations. So there could have been somebody moving along on stage stagecoaches, killing. I think that the predator instinct uh, does exist, sadly, in, in, in human beings. It, it, so maybe one day uh, they will turn up another serial killer. I, I'm fairly sure there was one active in Essex as a poisoner in the early 19th century. And there were instances of, of poison being used in, uh, for example, if, if somebody had a disagreement with one of the local uh, sweet makers, uh, people might try and get poisoned the sweets. And, but then that also led to urban myths about poison sweets. So, we've got to be really careful about pointing the finger of serial killer. When we get to Jack the Ripper, originally known as the Whitechapel murderer, we can certainly say that as that emerges, there is or was a serial killer. And the FBI, uh, with a team including John Douglas and Robert Ressler and some very talented uh, detectives, uh, they put together this scheme where they could uh, kind of start profiling the killer. So learning about what are the what do, do the descriptions all cancel out, or does the killer? Can you kind of work out from the attacks where they are localized to? You know, is the person operating from a local area? And that that kind of helps train really really good detectives today. It's a great case study. But when we come to the killer that became known as Jack the Ripper, they never caught him. And to be honest, it could be her. Uh, <laughs> the chances of uh, that killer being a, a, a woman, I think, are extremely, extremely slim. I really, really do. But because they never caught them or positively identified this person who seemed to have 
uh, almost like a, was it different people giving different descriptions or what, what, what was the killer a, a, a chameleon like shapeshifter? <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean. Uh, right. It's it's the attacks are carried out at night. They never identified for sure who it was. If you go to Scotland Yard today, once upon a time there would have been quite a sizable collection of uh, folders and files regarding the investigation. There were hundreds of letters sent in purporting to know who the killer is or claiming to be from the killer. It's incredible, this sudden explosion of letters. Uh, all started off by the one letter that pop which was probably probably written by a reporter so it's quite clever uh, is that the As, one where it said it was from hell ah no that's or was that is that true is that is is that true that's don't jump the gun just as yet see <laughs> <laughs> the one that's written probably because we can't say for certain probably by a reporter was the one that as this the, the murders kicked off and we can look at each murder if you wish but when you get one two murders maybe three and the press were sort of thinking about earlier murders so we're, we're looking at quite a localized time in or, or in the autumn of 1888 but the press will always look at unsolved murders and think, could this person have been responsible for earlier murders? So by the time you get two or three murders, that are quite probably Jack the Ripper, they've had a good dig around and they're talking about four, five, you know, and, and street gossip will get you up to even more victims. The climate of fear uh, gives you a situation where people are talking about a spectre, a ghost, even the Whitechapel vampire. But then it comes along this letter to, sent to the Central News Agency and it's signed. It's the Dear Boss letter and it is signed Jack the Ripper. And in that nom de plume, he, whoever wrote that captured something of the essence of those times because they'd had spring Jack. They had had Jolly Jack Tar. Victorians knew the term jack-o'-lanterns, you know, for these strange little lights you would see. So it's it's got that air of mystery. It's got the air of old fear. But Jack would also be an everyman character. So it really encapsulated it in such a way that even killers in Great Britain even if they don't actually rip, if they don't use a knife, they're, they could be stranglers, they could be people that attack with a hammer. They become known as, if, if it's a serial of killings, they are rippers. And that gives every, everybody will know in Britain and probably around the world that if, if he is the Ipswich Ripper, uh, this guy is a pretty serious serial killer. It's, it's entered into common parlance. Before we get into all of the legends surrounding Jack the Ripper, one of the things I really liked about your book is that it's an almanac. And what it does is a series of cases, right? That kind of paints the picture of what London was like back then. Can you tell us what was the scene back then? The book was quite groundbreaking in its day because newspapers on i mean the book's getting on for 10 15 years old now and it was the f the first book to really draw on computerized newspaper archives and use the search facility to really put us in in touch with such questions as the myth of ripper london swirling smog gas lamps and a killer dressed in a top hat and a cape. And I wanted to see, did that really exist? And what I found that was quite intriguing was that the number of knife crimes, the fatal knife crimes on the street were extremely rare. Now you'd think mm. that, you know, that the East End was tough. It was where it was the hardest part of all of London. London was the center of the great British Empire. Now, 
That's what they call it back then. We know there were a lot of things wrong with this so-called great <laughs> British empire. So mm. don't get me on that bandwagon. Uh, but the point <laughs> is, uh, in those days, kids were raised to respect their country's flag. Queen Victoria had been on the throne forever. It seemed an, an unassailable country in the world. Kids would know the map of the British Empire, and it was an empire upon which they said the sun never sets because it was so far spread that wherever you were, uh, at some point in the day, there would always be sun on the empire. But the underbelly of all of this in London was that people that had hit, hit hard times immigrant pop population, an immigrant population of Polish Jewish people, people from Central European countries, people, and you'll see this story repeated today, people are afraid of the, the strange, the unknown, and, and people coming in an influx who, for their own kind of peace of mind and safety, kind of find enclaves in the East End of London. The East End of London, it, it, it's it's hard up street. The houses that had been built for, say, just one family of four people, if they had a bit of money, um, and there was money in the East End. The weird thing is that cheek by jowl, you had people who were doctors and surgeons at the London Hospital living on the road frontages, but you walk up the alleyways and you will find biting poverty. This is the hypocrisy of that time. And what was so disturbing about these crimes is that people kind of knew it was there in London. But the rest of the country, they're just seeing pictures of Great Britain. You're seeing the Houses of Parliament. You're seeing Buckingham Palace. You're seeing pageantry. But suddenly they realised that, yeah, there's, there's re real hard times in every city across the land. And, oh, wow, even in London. And in the, and London, the biting poverty where some women end up uh, having to sell themselves for tuppence for a bed. And the tragedy was that what people often say, well, a lot of these women were not prostitutes. Well, a prostitute regularly earns their money uh, by selling their body for sex. But the East End was such that life was so precarious that through misfortune, having sickness, having illness, losing work, or, yes, taking two drink. That that happened too. It was so hard. It was biting. You turned a drink for solace and it's a slippery, slidey slope. So that some of these women living these precarious lives with partners that might well beat them up as well. It, it was horrific. They might just end up be the next woman on the street. And that is why it was so terrifying. So in my book, I wanted to bring out those stories of, of women finding those hard times. I wanted to show the crimes that were typical of that time. I wanted people to have a feeling for the attitude of Victorian Britain to death, to poverty, to trying to understand and, and make a difference to, to, to some of those situations, some of the detective work that was around at that time, good and bad. So, yeah, it's a, the, the idea of an almanac was... I'll never get a chance to research every single story, but the stories that I'd collected over the years and I was finding now by using online news, British newspapers for the very first time, I thought, let's get them out there. Let's get it shared and, and let's give people a real insight into the East End that where the Jack the Ripper crimes took place. Well, I think it's, it's done really well. Um, there's a couple of stories that really stood out. One of them was of the street peddler who was selling like cat meat. I think he called him the cat meat peddler or something like that. Yeah, and he was selling sure. just whatever you could find, probably roadkill or <laughs> like a penny. And then that he had the, the hot potato guy who was selling hot potatoes. <laughs> they, and then he, it, this, was, this was the way it was. The cat's meat seller, it would often be horse meat. Uh, if you think about it, we've got thousands of horses in London. If you think as many cars as there were at the height of people using cars in urban areas, think of that many. What do you think of the number of carriages there must have been? If you wanted to get around, uh, in, in, you wanted to be mobile, you wanted to deliver from door to door, it's all horse-drawn. 
there were occasional um, milk sellers that would go down round with a churn, mostly horse drawn. But when you get to the harder up areas, yeah, they would push a barrow around. But the barrow wielding cat's meat seller, he'd go and get horse meat from the what they call the knacker's yard. Um, horses and, and cows would go off to their uh, bones and parts of their body would be used to make glue. But there, there would be soft meat that could be so it could be eaten by humans as well. So they'd kind of start off at the more affluent areas where they would sell the best cat's meat to the more affluent families. And then he would wheel the wheelbarrow of the horse meat down to the poorer areas. And people might have a little bit of horse for, <laughs> for <laughs> to have a bit of meat on the table. And that was seen as good quality. You know, that was the stuff. Wow, we've got some meat for the table. I gather it's quite popular in France, but I, 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 I've never tried horse. Well, part of the story is you also have an account of a painter, Richard Dad. Uh, he was one of he was a famous murderer himself, wasn't he? Do you he, remember he that story? He certainly was. He he was an yes, he was an infamous murderer. He wasn't a serial killer, but he he had murdered, and he ended up in the criminal lunatic asylum in, in Great Britain, and he was a painter, and what he saw for real or what he saw um because of the the, the the mental condition he was suffering we're not sure but he believed he saw little people fairy folk <laughs> so he captured some of those in his paintings and sketches so who knows what he was here he was a remarkable character uh but quite a scary one too yeah that one just stood out for some reason but back to the topic um one of the more stories that you've had that really speaks to the Jack the Ripper case is all the brothel houses. And I guess there was some kind of law that came into place to where they had to close a lot of those down. And so these women end up back on the streets as pop prostitutes, just kind of creating that scene for a predator. Right. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Uh, you would find high-class brothels, courtesans, and high-class prostitutes, mistresses. That's very much the West End, because the West End would be associated with theatres. And in the theatre boxes, particularly of the more er the earlier 19th century, you know, they used to have these sort of boxes around the side. You'd have the pit for sort of standing viewing, but in these boxes, they would be where... Uh, you would go and watch a performance, and that's why the overtures are always so good, because that's the best bit of, of an opera, uh, is, is the overture. You, you think of the Barber of Seville. We all know the, the, the Figaro chorus. Oh, it's fantastic. Here it all comes. You know, we think of the Mozart, we think of the Magic Flute. Wonderful. But the rest of it, some people will name that tune, but quite a lot will not. That's because uh, while that's going on, some of these ladies of the night would uh, be in the boxes entertaining the gentlemen and some of the ladies too. Uh, so yes, it was odd in the in in the West End. It was a, a bit naughty, uh, and Covent Garden. I mean, there were there were even guidebooks produced for the women of Covent Garden who were the most alluring and most appealing. Uh, and, and value for money, you know. Ah, he, that's human cattle, for God's sake. But wow. they were different times. But what happened was when the women kind of got a little older, the charm of the youth, maybe even in with, with maybe some sexual transmitted diseases, maybe they'd taken to drink. Um, when times got hard, they gradually go further and further towards the East End. And the East End, there may have been a few uh, brothel houses there, but I think the police are pretty tight on those. As I say, a lot of these women are not professional prostitutes that are in the East End. These are women that really have no other way to earning uh, an, uh, what they used to call a DOS, a bed for the night, these were the big tenement houses, um, DOS houses. You had to have no penny on you if you were going to go into the workhouse 
for the night. You, you must have no, absolutely no money. You couldn't sleep on the streets. That, if the policeman caught you sleeping on the street, they'd move you on. So that's why tramps used to be seen, what they used to call people on the tramp. Uh, people with no real home to go to. They'd be asleep on benches during the day with their clothes hanging up on the railings of the park. Uh, that's why right next to Christchurch, which is in the heart of Whit Ripper territory, in opposite Spitalfields Market, if you see this, the film From Hell, they actually start going down this, this church, and uh, they pan down. That's Christchurch. I think they had used some graphics and they rebuilt it in Prague where they filmed it, but it's all but that wonderful start scene, and that building is often seen in, in From Hell with Johnny Depp. Right next door to that, the park was called Itchy Park because that's where all the people on the tramp used to go uh, during the day and they'd be kind of scratching around with the lice in the infestations <laughs> and scabs that they developed. So it was it was terrible, terrible, terrible. And the women that were suddenly... They, remember, they're not professionals. These are women that have got nothing else. Um, hmm. it that's was really sad. Utterly tragic and why this is d doubly so, triply tragic, is that these women would know a quiet place to take somebody. Somebody, you know, they'd be familiar with an area, a place, a, a tenement building, a backyard, an alleyway, where they'd, you know, you'd be quiet for 10, 15, 20 minutes. They'd know that the police would patrol that area, but they'd know, right, well, we, we'll be all right there because he's on the other side of his patrol area. We'll be all right for five or 10 minutes. And that's the tragedy that people think, oh, Jack the River must have known the East End like the back of his hand. No, he, he was relying him. on the prostitutes. Taking him somewhere quiet. They did his work for him. It, that's the tragedy of it. So much is ascribed to this super killer. He, he, he or she, and I suspect it's he, wasn't. He, he was a very wily predator. How many victims did he have? Again, because he was never caught, we don't know. We don't know for sure. There's what's referred to... Uh, I think it was a phrase possibly coined by my late friend Martin Fido, uh, who was a wonderful Jack the Ripper historian, along with Donald Rumbelow, some of the really early ones uh, that really helped capture that imagination, along with Stephen Knight, who wrote the book The Final Solution. Uh, Donald Rumbelow's book is, is, has gone through numerous uh, reprints over the years, and Donald's still around, bless him, a wonderful man he is a true gentleman of, of crime history and, and a really lovely fellow. Um, when we think about who were the victims, who all, I prefer the women he killed. Who did he kill? Because these were, these were women trying to make the best of their very tragic lives. Uh, there's five. There's five that we commonly ascribe to Jack the Ripper. They're known as the canonical five. The clever money is on six. The clever be and the the first victim, the first woman to be killed, was Martha Tabram, and she was killed in George Yard Buildings. She was rather than being ripped up, she suffered multiple stab wounds. And when I lecture to my students, and I'll say to them, I said, "Look, just get a biro in your hand or a ruler." Don't get near anybody. Just go into thin air. And you imagine your pen or your ruler is a knife. And you plunge that into a human body more than 30 times. And actually get them to count. Count to 10, to 20, to 30. By the time you get to 30, plunging into just thin air, your arm hurts. All right? Your arm is tired. Martha Tabram had over 30 stab wounds inflicted to her body. So that's a clear indication of its, its rage. It's, ra it's a rage killing. You know, if some, somebody's had an argument with a prostitute, they think she's robbed them or whatever, she's trying to be sly with them or whatever, they're drunk and they can't perform sexually or whatever it is. These tragic deaths happen. 
and they still happen today. But they're normally a strangulation, a blow, a stabbing. But not even today, 30 stab wounds. That's that's just horrific. Yeah. And the thinking is, and there are, there are people, I, I'm a historian. That's what I do. But I've been had the privilege to lecture in medical history for over 20 years now. And I've had the chance to talk to those that are involved with surgery, with medicine, clinical psychologists, uh, forensic uh, people that work throughout the, the gamut of, of forensic work. They all seem to have a, an interest in the Jack, the Ripper crimes. But it is, it's uh, dark, darkly fascinating because we all want to try and get a grip on what, why was this person not caught? The, the clever money is on poor Martha Tabram being the first victim and Jack, no matter how many times they said, and at that time, the killer was simply known as the Whitechapel murderer. How many times had the murderer stabbed her? And the killer simply wasn't getting out of it what he had expected. And that's why the next killing, the first killing of Polly Nichols, which is just weeks later, you know, it, it's, it's, it, this is a very narrow time period between August and November for all six victims in 1888. So when Polly Nichols comes along, that's when you'll see the, the first ripping and mutilation uh, to the bodies of these women. And when you say mutilation, um, the stories about body parts being removed and this sort of thing, that actually happened, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with the very first case with Martha, no, that didn't. Uh, when we start to see uh, the first murder, Polly Nichols, Bucks Row, when you look on a map, it's not far away. It's All of this is within a square mile. You know, all of these attacks, it's a very, very localized area. Polly was mutilated and left on the street. Nothing was removed to, from her. But when we get to uh, Annie Chapman, which was, it was a killing known as the Hanbury Street Horror, um, September 1888. She has, uh, she's, I, I personally believe that the killer had some medical knowledge. Because of the way serial killers are, it's a ra often a rage killing if, if it's involving a knife and mutilation. And a rage killing can look like, and this is not from my own personal studies, from the studies of Dr. Rivers in the 1950s. He was looking at um, homosexual serial killers of women, and that's really unusual. In fact, some people said it didn't even exist, but it, it did, and it does. They are very, very rare, but it often means it, it, it has a, a, a severe hatred of women and the destruction of the identity of a woman. In other words, that you could see that she has breasts or, or her genital area and things like a womb. And, and you will see that it's rage. If you think of a child with a crayon scribbling like that, that's what some of this fury killing can look like. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. Jack the Ripper didn't do that. He he goes from multiple stabs to progressively worse op attacks on the body, ripping up a body and then opening it. And when you get to having, he's got a quiet area. He's in a backyard be behind 29 Hanbury Street. He's not being disturbed. It's dark. They never fence. And he opens up Annie Chapman. And he takes her entrails and places her over, over her shoulder. And then that's when we see the first body parts. They're, they're all right. It's, it's all around the uterus area, and and it gets right. progressively worse. When you get to what they call the double event, end of the month, thirtieth September, eighteen eighty-eight. Poor old Longley Stride. She's on Burner Street. And her throat is cut up a little alleyway near a, uh, near a working men's club. We think that Louis Deemschutz, who was coming back with his pony and, and tradesman's cart, disturbed Jack. 
the, the horse reared up as they went up the alleyway. And Louis couldn't see why the horse wouldn't move on, so he strikes a match. And under the light of the match, he glimpses the body of a woman. So Louis goes down to say, you know, see, is it a drunk? You know, what's going on? Her body's still warm. And it, it, there were even reports that he could feel the blood gushing from her throat. He then rushes inside the working men's club where he was a, a steward or secretary as part of it. And so, you know, he raises the alarm. And it's thought Jack was hiding in the shadows, slips out into the street and crosses over. It's, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes walk, depending which way you go from Berners Street to Mitre Square. Mitre Square, he crosses over into the City of London Police area. So this involved in London has Metropolitan Police and City. He goes into the city. Mitre Square, somewhere along that route to there, he encounters Kathy Eddowes. The tragedy is kathy has been in police custody because she was down the old gate pump earlier that night, so drunk she was impersonating a fire engine. <laughs> and she gets <laughs> put in at Bishopgate Police Station. Typical drunk people. Oh, well, absolutely. It's great fun. <laughs> and she's released and she... They remember her parting message. She, the, the words "old cock" in bin. It's like the old, the old cock. Well, you got your plume up, you know. And she says, "Good night, old cock," to the policeman. And off she, off she goes up the road. And less than an hour later, her horrifically bald, mutilated body is found in a, co a dark corner of Mitre Square. Uh, you can see the same opening of the body cavity that you would see with Annie Chapman from Hanbury Street. The entrails are removed, but this time he's delivered cuts to her eyes. Part of her ear is removed. In one of the Jack the Ripper letters, it had even threatened to remove her ear, you know, his next victim's ears just for jolly. One of her ears is removed, but the body cavity is open. Her, She's it's it's horrific, and I shan't go into all the details for the li for the listeners. But what happened was, her uterus was removed; it's taken away, as was one of her kidneys. And when you see, and I've discussed this with uh, current surgeons, surgeons that have worked for years and are now teaching y y young people how to become surgeons for the future, some of them will, will actually say that, that that's no way the work of a doctor. But those that look at it more calmly and consider uh, those that have a bit of a knowledge of Victorian surgery say well they repeat the words of the medics of the time that examine the, the bodies of Jack the Ripper and they say it shows medical knowledge and, that, and that's that's the, the, that's the thing that really scared them that it was not a man of the street it was somebody who had medical knowledge and that would have taken money in those days it would have taken hands-on skill because if you think about it a kidney is in subcutaneous fat it, it it's it's soft so to identify a kidney in a body and th this mutilation including the removal of a uterus without a massive slash and destruction of a body it's under 10 minutes between the last the dark. and the next it's 10 minutes in the dark in the dark yeah yeah then you, you might have got a little bit of lamp lamp light there is no fog we might add on every single one of the ripper killers there's no fog so we might have had a bit of moonlight but that was it and to work at that speed with that kind of skill uh was disturbing and then you you see the final killing of uh, poor mary kelly in in november uh, 1888 and October was clear they wondered what had happened to the killer and she was the only woman to be killed by Jack the Ripper in her own room and that's why you'll see these infamous pictures I mean that's why the, the police had never seen a killing like it the, the destruction of Mary on her bed uh, absolutely horrific and, and they never recovered her heart it, it, so the heart was stolen well, hmm. stolen. Some people wonder: was it was it boiled up and and, and did it uh, blow up in the kettle or or, or or whatever it was? It's absolutely horrific. 
uh, if people wish to look at the, the crime scene photograph, it, it's available online. I really, <laughs> it's there. It, it, it's, it, it's absolutely horrific. And, and men, the, the detective officers, the constables who were there, including Walter Jew. Walter Jew was a young policeman. And he went on to catch the famous murderer, Dr. Crippen. And Walter Dew, as a young policeman, saw Mary Kelly's room with the body there, and it haunted him for the rest of his life. Uh, and 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 wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? You know, if you yeah, you, you will know people who have served in, in any type of emergency services in the armed services, and you see you see a body that's destroyed, beyond bomb blast, mutilated. Uh, unthinkable yeah it's it's definitely unthinkable neil we need to take a quick break but when we when we return we'll talk about some of the suspects and legends that came out around who the jack jack the ripper was are you interested in learning more about the world of vitality and joy related to holistic healing crystal magic and spirituality for inner peace check out my friends at mysoultopia.com this online metaphysical shop offers everything from spiritual consultations to ritual, spell work, clearing, and meditational supplies. Soultopia specializes in custom creations for the mind, body, and spirit, such as gorgeous handcrafted jewelry, tarot card readings, and shamanic healing drums. Soultopia offers an array of classes, intuitive sessions, coaching, and energy healings for people in all walks of life. Soultopia strives to raise your vibration for any life event. Become part of a unique Soultopian experience today by visiting my friends at mysoultopia.com. That's all one word, mysoultopia.com. And we're back. My guest tonight is BBC's historian and author Neil Story discussing the darker side of Jack the Ripper. Neil, before we took our break, we were discussing kind of the mutilations with the body. And I don't want to get into all the details with that because it is pretty gruesome. Um, I think readers or listeners get the idea of, of how gruesome these murders were. But there was a whole slew of people that came out as suspects surrounding these uh, hmm. these murders. One such person was a physician in Mason. Can you talk about who Sir William Withy, I think his name is, Gall? William Withy Gull. So William Withy Gull was... He came from a very humble background. His his father worked on uh, as a bargeman in Essex, uh, but clearly William Gull, as a young man before the knighthood and before the medical training, had shown skills, good medical skills, and he progressed to become one of Queen Victoria's personal surgeons. The tragedy is that he, in later life, before autumn 1888, suffered a stroke and it, it, it froze part of his body so he couldn't operate as he had in the past. I think, oh, well, what happened was over the years, he's been named, as a, it's a very seductive story, to have a Queen's surgeon as Jack the Ripper. <laughs> And it, it is once you get something so seductive, it's like any urban myth, no matter how well you prove it wasn't him or her or that something or other really happened. The story is so seductive. It's appeared on film, on TV, it's in books. And it was, it came, uh, Dr. Stoll way, way in the, back in the late sixties, seventies, it had, claim to have come across some sort of diaries or, or documents that named a, a Queen's surgeon uh, involved in this conspiracy, whereby uh, a girl called Annie Crook had married uh, Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence. She was an artist model and he was the <laughs> heir to the thro throne. Well, she was, he was actually uh, Queen Victoria's grandchild. But, you know, when, 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 when Queen Vicky's son passes away, oh, well, guess what? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a real t tangly old web and <laughs> i just think it's so wrong to uh, malign a, re a really good surgeon but but where there is smoke there is fire i think we should absolve sir william withy goal of any notion of being jack the ripper i really don't think he is i don't think he was well enough to do that i don't think he would have committed those crimes but the term queen surgeon or a royal surgeon is an interesting one and over the years there have been a few suspects pointed out who had worked at the royal hospital in other words known as the east london hospital so who knows that there, there's do you think it was somebody thing. tied in that here's a weird thing you can't tell an awful lot from a human kidney a human kidney was sent to george lusk the chairman of the Whitechapel vigilance committee right it came in a box with the aforementioned from hell letter in fact it was half a kidney and it said the other half i have eaten it was very nice words to that effect the half of kidney was taken to the royal hospital where it was examined and Henry Smith, who was the commissioner of the City of London Police, recalled that it had been identified as a Ginny kidney from a woman in her mid-40s. Now, you, you could possibly identify it being a, a Ginny kidney suffering from something called Bright's disease. But to say it's from a woman and in her mid you can't sex a kidney. And it's not really very easy to get an age on it. So how could that surgeon have known <laughs> it was? Or was it? major smith spinning the yarn he told a very good story in his bio his autobiography the so plot thickens. It, is there a royal surgeon connection i think we have to say who knows but i'd be very i would be fairly sure after all these years where poor old william withy girl sir william has been in the frame i think we need to uh, let him rest in peace so what about Prince Albert? Wasn't he a suspect as well for a little bit? Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence. Ah, that's another part of this tale. Suspect. <laughs> yeah, it, it's odd because he, he did die before he, he ascended to the throne. He, he's, he's, uh, it was a mystery. He died, you know, from some illness. <laughs> Was it was he disposed mm -hmm. of? Who knows? But the problem is there. Uh, I don't think he's Jack the Ripper. But the here's an interesting thing. Lots of interesting things tonight. Uh, <laughs> now, the main man who had investigated Jack the Ripper crimes on the ground had been a Whitechapel officer. His name was Frederick Aberline. He's played by Johnny Depp in the film or Michael Caine in the 1988 docudrama. Abilene was the main man on the ground in Whitechapel in 1888, didn't catch Jack the Ripper. But when there is a scandal in Cleveland Street, only a couple of years or so after, it's investigated by Abilene. Now, the scandal is this. It's a, it's a homosexual brothel. Cleveland Street's another part of London. Abilene's gone back to Scotland Yard, but it's interesting that he gets deployed there. Now, the homosexual brothel has older men going with telegram boys, uh, doing dirty things with them, vile things. And among them was Prince Albert Victor and the master of the Queen's horse. There is what's called a D notice put on the, in, in the British press. So he's never named. Albert Victor is never in the press for, for those murders, uh, for involvement in the Cleveland Street scandal in the homosexual brothel. But the master of the Queen's horse was. And in those days, they would go and do the decent thing and they sort of use a revolver or they go and hang themselves. Uh, and he died in shame. But Albert Victor is kept out of it 
The investigating officer at Cleveland Street was Frederick Aberline, who was given a really good retirement term after that. Interesting. So, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think if um, the Duke of Clarence is being seen in seedy areas, yeah, he probably is, but he ain't killing women nor men, um, nor killing anybody else. And you might have seen right. a royal carriage in odd places. So it gets twisted in retelling and conspiracies, but I think we can rule him out quite safely. Although there's still all sorts of odd things associated with him. Yeah, he did die of syphilis, correct? Oh, <laughs> Could Just be had consumption, to throw that out there. could be some sort of ailment. You know, I, I, I am an English man. I, I still love our, our well, I love, I'm a great lover of our queen. We have a king. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've got to uphold the stuff, stiff upper lip, my dear. I'm sure it was some sort of ailment. And he died quietly in his bed. <laughs> there's, one, there's one other big legend that I want to talk about surrounding the suspects. And this is an American uh, serial killer and i think you know where i'm going with this h.h H. holmes was on that block no. for a while. cl you're no? disappointing me now <laughs> no. no no do you know what i'm not going to even dignify that with it no it's been proved wasn't there couldn't have done it he is one of your most infamous Amer american serial killers without doubt and those murder rooms it's extraordinary. And that's the story of H.H. H. Holmes. That's what he does. That's what he did. Jack the Ripper? No. No. And I, I, I respect Jeff Mudgett, and I respect what he, he, he's got a fascination in, in this story. I, I gather History Channel or some TV channel over there's bought into it, and they're flogging a dead horse. And they were told <laughs> very early on, but they'd committed by some pretty good Ripperologists that, do you know, it, it no, it doesn't work. So I'm, I'm very sorry to everybody, but no. And that it's not me. I've got no axe to grind. I'm a historian. I come in very neutrally. If you want a viable suspect with an American connection, allow me to present to you Francis Tumblety, Irish-born, settled in America, in New York. And down by the river, he started selling pornography. He got involved with a, a chemist that also conducted abortions. He learned backstreet medicine. He learned how to sell pimple banisher that was advertised in Harper's in, during the Civil War. He made a lot of money doing that. But he also made a lot of enemies because he used to name in the newspapers all the people he's helped to treat for their horrible and unsightly blemishes. Spot on. Wherever, wherever that man went, Francis Tumblety, murder followed him wherever he went. He was in London in 1888. Before he came to London, he was known to have a terrible hatred of women. He was known to have a collection of, get this, uterus in, preserved in jars. Yeah, this guy is, he looks normal. But he's bonkers. He's he's out there. He always wants to put himself into the frame in different stories of, of that. Are, of he even he's even embroiled, wanted to embroil himself in the Lincoln uh, assassination. He's he's dark. He's dangerous. And in fact, I found the greatest collection of Jack the Ripper suspect letters, contemporary suspect letters, between Francis Tumblety and Thomas Henry Hall Caine. Now, Hall Caine was the first man to send, sell a million books in the English language, but next to nobody's heard of him now. But Hall Caine was a great friend of, probably the best friend of, Bram Stoker. So it's hardly surprising that when Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, if you know what you're looking for, there are all sorts of clues that point to the Jack the Ripper crimes, even down to five boxes, five canonical victims. Where does he put the box in London in the East End, in the East End in Chicksand Street? So if you put a pin of the compass in and do a circle around it, all the victims fit in the circle. All sorts of stuff like that. Now, you're going to say, well, that's all quirky stuff. Ha what happened to Francis Tumblety? Well, Francis Tumblety, because he was 
of the homosexual persuasion, he got caught for a lewd act and he was in police hand, but he was bailed and he flees back to America. The American press even said Jack the Ripper is back in America. But in those days, the press didn't coordinate. The place didn't coordinate. He was able to flip, flip, flip from place to place. But guess what? My friend, Mike Hawley, and other really good uh, American researchers, people like Roger Palmer and Joe Chet Cooty, have traced where Tumble T went after his return to America. This has only been possible thanks to online newspapers and all sorts of newspaper releases. But guess what? Wherever he went, murder went too. So believe you me, the clever money for Jack the Ripper. Now, it doesn't mean this is the forever Jack, because we could all be proved wrong on the day of judgment. The clever man. That's really interesting. Where did he end Fast up? Do you job. know? He, yes, he ended. He's, he finished up his days in a convent in America, in a convent hospital. A very wealthy man, loads of money, and died in his sleep. The weird Lucky thing was, him. when he did die, he was, he, had, he was known to have a big moustache, bigger than mine. And and it would turn out it was a stick on in later life, stick on moustache. And he he had advanced um, venereal disease that had clearly affected him as well. And he was a hermaphrodite. Weird or what? Doesn't mean all that hermaphrodites are serial killers, but it, it was one of the reasons why he was motivated to, plus his sexually transmitted disease that he, uh, that he was known to have. in a, in a ve- and, and over the years, it became more and more advanced. He it, The more you dig the more you find with Tumble T. With other suspects, the more you dig, the weaker they become as a suspect. So, hmm. yeah, and he was named by by uh, its Chief Inspector, Little Child, a special branch, you know, one of the most, the specialist national protection unit in Great Britain, you know, when, when the Fenian bombers are blowing up London, special branch are trying to tackle that. Any threat to the nation, special branch was and still does deal with that. F- Chief Inspector Little Child was the only senior police officer in post before, during, and remained in after the Jack the Ripper killings. So if Little Child says, yeah, Dr. Francis Tumblety is a highly likely suspect, then I think we have to respect that. I think so, too. That's really interesting. So <laughs> one of the things about this case that brings it to life even today is that there are tours that go through Whitechapel that you can actually see some of these locations, correct? That's correct. The tours that exist today, the murder sites are all accessible more or less. Um, But London's changed. And the murder sites are changed really beyond comprehension. You could go to, you can go, you can find the spot because roads and access areas don't tend to change. So you could stand on that spot in Mitre Square, you know, you you, you can rip a corner there. You can stand on Bucks Row in the, in the opening to, to the yard where Polly Nichols was killed. 29 Hanbury Street, you could stand just beside it because it's now a, a former brewery building that's now used as an art space. So they exist, but they've changed. But around that area, there are still cobbled streets, the same cobbled streets that in all probability Jack the Ripper walked up. There were still buildings cheek by jowl with modern developments. During World War II, the area was badly bombed as well. So there there have been losses, but, oh no, if if you go to the East End, there are still gas lamps. They're now lit by electricity, but there are still gas lamp standards on the streets. There are still cobbled streets, still very, very old uh, 18th century uh, structured streets uh, like Fournier Street. You you will feel the past when you go to the East End. Yep, and then I'm multiple tours you know I'm, I'm aware of one tour company that can have five six seven different groups out on one night every night of the week so here in the u.s um from the gruesome mer- murders of the sharon tate house and, and those four mm-hmm. individuals at the sharon tate house 
there's a lot of uh, ghost hunters and paranormal investigators that will go into that house or the area that those murders took place and capture a lot of EVPs and this sort of thing. Is that true with um, Jack the Ripper murders? Do you know if investigative teams have come up with EVPs or anything surrounding it, the it's Jack the Ripper cases? Uh, that's, that every tour guide I have ever known has taken a t tour around over the years and they will talk of somebody experiencing something. Over, you know, you do a tour guide for two or three years, there will be probably more than one person that will say, I'm, I'm feeling something now, or it will be an unusual experience. They will feel a sudden cold when no one else is feeling cold. Maybe it's the chill of fear, or maybe it's a spirit. But London was a busy city. You have to remember that, you know, it's it's been a great concentration of humanity for many, many years. So are they film, feeling the ghost of Jack the Ripper? Are you feeling the ghost of one of the women that he killed? Or are you feeling the ghost of Mrs. Miggins, who used to live in Miller's Court, you know, around the corner? Uh, we don't know. But we do know that in the years after the Jack the Ripper murders, the bodies of those that he killed had apparently manifested sort of to glow on the streets in, in Miller's Court and in Bucks Row in particular, uh, they were seen as, yeah, there would be certain times of the year when people would say that you would see uh, the glow of these figures. For investigations, I think it needs, um, I'm not aware of a, a really good, serious, focused investigation uh, taking place to this date. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. But to my knowledge, to see something that's maybe televised I, i'm not a i don't watch an awful lot on youtube i may have missed that but to actually get involved and seriously look at that um i'm not aware of it i think it needs i think it needs to be done there there's some of these folks uh in the states and i know in the uk have worked with uh police professionals uh i know folks who've worked with the fbi in america for example in missing person cases and and you know, in the location of, 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 of people who have been murdered. I think it would be really interesting to see if their sensitivities uh, pick up on, on, on that. It, but they would have to come at some very unsociable times of day. Because if, it's, if you come in the evening, there are the Ripper tours. But the Ripper murders tended to take place very early in the morning. You know, one thirty, two o'clock in the morning. Now, the river tours aren't out at that time of the day. <laughs> and I think if you were to go to those sites at that time of day with somebody who really has that gift, you know, and there are a few out there, and I, I, I count several of them as, as personal friends, so I won't name them all because it's quite a list. Somebody who genuinely has that gift, I think that would be a fascinating TV documentary, but not only to reach uh, the victims in that way, but also uh, those that, that he'd killed, but to tell more of the, the story of the women who had mm -hmm. been killed and the, the backstory of the women of Whitechapel than just focusing on their killer. Yeah. yeah, that's so true. You're absolutely right about that. Their stories are kind of hidden and forgotten about. Yeah, I over the years, I mean, way back, uh, must be 20 years ago, Neil Stubbins Sheldon did an awful lot of work. That's it's not he, he deserves a lot of credit because he managed to track down extant descendants of, of the families, you know, uh, a, a remarkable piece of work. Then Harley Rubenhold came along with her five book, um, which again presented her take on the crimes. And no matter what the arguments for and against her work may have been, uh, it has brought the women's story to the fore again. And no matter what, that's important. Uh, their story needs to be told. And I, and I think that's long overdue uh, uh, with, with a, a, a really, not, not just having a, a man coming and explaining. I don't think it needs to be man explained. I would love to be part of that documentary, but let's have a really strong team 
of, of women, uh, including women who are involved in uh, in criminal psychology, women that have worked in, now work in forensics and some of the groundbreaking uh, women in, in, in both sides of the Atlantic that could get involved with, with the, the examination of this case. And I think if they were to, with a team of us chaps to back them up, not they really need us because they could do it, but, you know, we don't want to be left <laughs> out. <laughs> Let's work as a team. Whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, God, men and women working together. God, can that really happen? <laughs> You know, let's do it. Let's get it together, but give it the strong emphasis on women because ultimately there's only one Jack the Ripper. There's five, six victims, all women. So let's give that the, the strength uh, that it needs. The balance needs to be strong women. Let's get the stories out there and let's work as a team and get their story told. Well, Neil, we're at the bottom of the hour, but I do want to talk about your new book coming out in a few days. Bram Stoker. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. It's in the UK. It's been released. We've been out a month. And I think the first edition in UK is almost sold out uh, incredibly. Uh, well, not incredibly, because Bram Stoker was brilliant. He's the man who wrote Dracula. Uh, and it's a, a lifetime of love of subject. Uh, he's a friend of Hall Kane. There's a little bit about Jack. and My Dracula Secrets book explored that story Oh, 10 years ago and a bit more. So Bram is a fascinating man. He's more than just Dracula, but there's a lot about Dracula and how he created it, created the story of the book. And I know that there are so many fans of Dracula in, in America and Bram fans. So this is a tribute to Bram the man, my one of my heroes, uh, and the people he knew, the world that he inhabited, the world of the theatre, the Lyceum, and, and the characters he knew, uh, and some of the people that knew him with their reminiscences of Bram. So it's not a lot of me wet witchering on, but a lot of people who knew him and Bram in his own words. So Bram Stoker, author of Dracula, by me, Neil R. Story. And I think if you like, if you like Dracula, you'll enjoy that book. I can't wait to read it. I think it comes out in America. I saw available on Amazon in just a few days. Excellent. I have yes, it, it will be. It will be. Hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. And for listeners out there, this was author and historian Neil Story, Jack the Ripper's London. This is your host, C.L. Thomas. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of Small Town Tales Podcast. While you wait for the next episode, Follow the show on Facebook under Small Town Tales Podcast. Learn more about C.L. Thomas at our website, clthomas.org. Small Town Tales Podcast was produced by 22 Creations Multimedia, LLC.